which is Sister Nevedita. Um, her name is Margaret Noble. She was born in Dungannon in 1867. I believe, I'm here basically essentially to say that I think she's been under-researched and uh, that, you know, she warrants a lot more work being done on her and to uh, give some pointers to where that might be done or to uh, solicit for the funding to do it myself, you know. She played a prominent role in Indian nationalism in the early 20th century. I compare her to Patrick Pierce because she argued, like him, that the native religious genius of the people justifies their nationhood. A question that hangs over her is whether she was an aid to violent revolutionaries. There's some evidence that she was, or at least that the British authorities in Bengal thought she was. She combines two things that often go together, religion and nationalism, and the symbiosis between these continues to intrigue us and bother us. So for academics interested in that mix and how it plays into modern political violence, <coughs> I think she is worth studying. She is also interesting in that her life points up parallels, and my Kindle has just switched itself off, <laughs> between the ways in which religious attitudes were evolving in India and in England in her time. In 19th century England, intellectuals were trying to find new ways of being spiritual after science had created problems for biblical literalism. In India, people were trying to modernize Hinduism to make the case that it was not a primitive and superstitious religion and to demonstrate the tradition from tradition that India did not need to be tutored by Britain in how to be civilized. Nivedita is revered in India as a saint, and that's one of the more popular images of her. <clears throat> She's hardly noticed in Irish history, though she was born in Dungannon. There have been recent efforts to bring her to the attention of the people of Tyrone. Much of that work has focused on her religious enthusiasm and accepts her as a spiritual exemplar. I'm inclined to think that defining someone as a saint, come on, is always going to get them wrong and ignore the complexity of their personality, even in the case of those who thought they were saints themselves. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> Since I am starting out with the acceptance that too little is yet known about her, I can say frankly that she intrigues me because aspects of her life resonate with aspects of my own, not least in that she had an interest in Hinduism and mysticism. I lived for four years in my twenties in an ashram in India, Hindu ashram, and also the she intrigues me because she was a journalist, so we're similar in that way as well. And some of the most telling of her letters, those more revealing of her hard edge, are those written to another journalist. In them one hears an echo of the cynical, occasionally caustic tone, familiar I think to all journalists, born probably of the need to be succinct and detached, even insensitive. More research can be done on her by seeking out the journalism which she wrote in England before going to India. Much of her Indian work is already collated. Also, she kept diaries which she entrusted to friends in anticipation of future publication, but I've not been able to find any trace of them in published works about her, so I don't think anyone has used them yet. So my starting point is that if anyone wants to give me 50 grand, I'll go and do this research and do a book on her, but equally any research student in religion and terrorism, history, Irish history, Indian history, or a related field could surely get a decent PhD out of her. There's fallow ground there, that's what I'm saying. Nevedita means dedicated. She was dedicated by Swami Vivekananda. Let's have a look at him. There he is, Swami Vivekananda. Anybody seen him before? Anybody know this man? Nobody acquainted with him? No? Okay, I'm sure half of you are. Right. <laughs> so, she was dedicated by Swami Vivekananda to working for the Indian poor, adopted by him as a disciple, and then kept at a distance by him for fear that she was getting emotionally attached. To know her story, we need first to know about Vivekananda. He is a major figure in Indian history. He was one of the founder members of the Ramakrishna Mission. Okay, we'll go for another. Just, and then we'll come back to him. Sri Ramakrishna. She was a, he, was, he was a founder member of the Ramakrishna Mission. His own guru, Sri Ramakrishna, had taught that he had discovered the truth behind all religion, having found God through Hindu meditation, Christian worship, and Islamic worship, trying them all. Vivekananda took this message out to the world. Though a contemplative mystic, a yogi himself, he was also a man with an enormous personality, a stirring orator, and an organizer. 
Vivekananda's challenge was to reframe traditional Hinduism for the modern world, to convince people that it was an intelligent and mature belief system as worthy of respect as the religion of the colonizer. He was not the first to come up with that idea. Another movement at the time, the Brahmo Samaj, had sought to take Hinduism out of the restrictive caste system and polytheism towards a focus on Brahm, the one underlying reality. A slight digression here, in about 1981, I was going round Loch Esk on my wee Vespa scooter mm -hmm. and I met a really charming young Swiss woman called Veronique. And Swiss, Veronique was one quarter Indian. Her mother was uh, one half Indian and half Irish. And the Indian side of her mother's parentage were the Sens, were the family of Kashyap Chandra Sen. So when we were having a drink together that night in a hotel in Mount Charles and she told me the story, I said, oh, are you anything to Kashyap Chandra Sen? And I think that was the first time in her life she'd ever been asked that question. <laughs> So Vivekananda travelled to the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893 and made an impressive speech. He excoriated modern Christians and they loved him for it. He said, the son of man would not find among you a stone in which to rest his head. But he was helped to a nice bed himself and to good food by Mrs. Belle Hale, a Christian scientist in her family. And probably through her he made connections to other Christian scientists in London who would give him shelter there and an audience for his teaching. And it was in London that he met Margaret Noble. So let's have a look at her background. I can't keep just changing these all the time, can I? Alright, we'll go, yeah. Easier than I thought. I'm an Apple person myself. She came from Dungannon in County Tyrone. She was born in 1867, grew up in England, and was educated in an orphan school after her father died. Her father was a Methodist minister, but Margaret, or Margot, as she preferred to be called, went through periods of enthusiasm for other religious perspectives, including High Church Anglicanism and Christian Science, before becoming a disciple of Vivekananda. She is variously written about by Indian sources as the daughter of a priest and the descendant of Irish revolutionaries. Both claims are misleading. Her father would not commonly have been thought of as part of a priesthood, more the leader of a congregation than the officiator directing it. And she, in fact, described herself often as English, and even as, quote, the most loyal of English women. <coughs> she was aware of Irish political demands for home rule, but she was born into a generation which was more stable than those which preceded it or which came after. She had made a considerable journey away from her Irish and Methodist roots before the age of 20 and her arrival in London. Her writing shows that she was well read in philosophy and comparative religion. She had at least a smattering of French. She could write on politics, education and art. This was without the benefit of a university education or even what would now be regarded as a complete secondary education. So I think she, she must have been quite remarkable. Before she left London, she had committed herself to a community of belief around the ideas of Christian science and spiritualism. Christian science was a means of rediscovering a way of being Christian that had scientific validity, particularly as a healing method. So just as Vivekananda was trying to reframe Hinduism as intelligible to the modern mind, so also were Christian scientists and others trying to fit Christianity into the new thinking and claiming that it was scientifically verifiable. Margaret would take a meandering spiritual journey, but in her guru Vivekananda, she heard echoes also of the teachings that she'd heard in her childhood, that God was accessible, could be experienced. <coughs> Margaret's father's calling was not political but spiritual, but the key idea that the poor could be uplifted first through being helped to rediscover the traditional Christian values also resonates with the teaching of Nevadita years later in India. For both father and daughter, as also for Vivekananda, religion and politics were inseparable. Religious instruction would elevate people into being informed and conscientious citizens, as well as saving their souls. So that was a, when I first wrote this paper, it was written for a, an Indian magazine, and it was to make the point that this woman did not live one life in Ireland and England, and then go to India and become something different. That there's continuity between the life that she lived in England and the life that she lived afterwards with her guru in India. Margaret's father's work took him to the north of England to train for his ministry among the workers in the textile mills of Liverpool and Manchester. Margaret and his sister Mary went as small children to England to be with their father. 
They were, from then on, likely to grow up thinking of themselves as English, with very little connection to Ireland. I'm sure we've all got nieces with English accents. That's very disheartening sometimes. <laughs> you know. The great tragedy of their young lives was their father dying in 1877, when Margaret was nine years old. Faced with the loss of a family income, her mother moved back to Ireland with the youngest child, a boy, Richmond, and later enrolled the two girls, Margaret and Mary, in an orphan school. This was the Crossley Heath Orphan School in Savile Park, Halifax. There were four years between the death of her father and her enrolment at Crossley Heath. We don't know what the family survived on in that time or where she was living. We know from the letters of Nevedita to her sister Mary in later years that their mother had been a difficult woman. I'm sure that's news to you all. <laughs> Mary seems to have been more distressed by her mother's treatment of her than she was. At least Nevedita argued that her mother's faults were more on the surface, a suggestion that one had to get to know her well to appreciate her qualities. Margaret was clearly urging Mary to forgive their mother, though for what we don't know, probably just for dumping them in an orphan school. Their faith in being sent to an orphan school need not evoke feelings, however, of horror informed by Dickensian accounts of orphanages and poor houses. This was a prosperous institution and was liberal for its day. It had been established for the orphan children of clergy and appears to have been well funded by philanthropists. Nevedita is now listed among the distinguished alumni of the school on its website. In 1886, after Margaret had left Crossley Heath, Prime Minister William Gladstone brought his first of two Home Rule Bills before Parliament. He lost by 30 votes and the immediate fallout was rioting in Belfast. Hopes of having been raised and then dashed. We don't know how aware Margaret was of the rioting at that time. After Crossley Heath, she took her first teaching post in Keswick at the age of 16. Her biographer, Lizelle Raymond, says that this was a time at which she was impressed by a more lavish style of worship than she would have known as a Methodist. In her book about Vivekananda, The Master as I Saw Him, she would draw comparisons and contrasts between Vivekananda's chanting and Gregorian chant. That Anglican form of worship is also closer to the style of the Hindu puja, with its flowers and bells and incense, than to the more undramatized form used within evangelical churches. Catholicism, in a sense, is like Catholicism in its love of image and incense. Protestantism is like Islam in its primary focus on the text of Scripture. Uh, when I was in my early days in India, I was, you know, very, very careful. This was like 40 years ago. Very careful to avoid, be wary of who I accepted food from, you know, or where, where I took food. And one day I was like, walking by the Ganges. And uh, this man, uh, uh, who, the big tilak on his forehead after his own puja, the big uh, mark, uh, just came over to me and gave me some rice, put it in my hand, said, Prasad, Prasad, and Prasad is the offering to God. It's, it's, it's essentially like the Eucharist ceremony in, in, in uh, Catholic worship and Christian worship. You offer uh, food to God and then you share it out. And, uh, and I thought, I didn't understand what he was talking about. I was about to throw this away. And somebody grabbed me by the arm and said, no, 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 Mr. Mulkey, no, no, no. So I said, I'll eat it later. <laughs> in later years, she would express her sadness that Catholicism had no place for her. Unlike the teachings of Ramakrishna and Vivekananda that she had adopted, Catholicism saw other religious movements as heathen and heretical. She wrote, I always feel like an exiled and repudiated child of the Church Catholic, and she in my eyes so unspeakably great and blessed. Strange words from an Ulster Methodist. But we know very little of Margaret's life at this time. We may speculate that the job in Keswick had been found for her by Crossley Heath, perhaps keen to protect a young woman on her own from the moral dangers of life in the city by sending her to a remote area. We may suppose also perhaps that she left Keswick to be more involved in the busy world, to make friends perhaps, to improve her chances of finding a husband. She went through at least three different jobs in different parts of England in her late teens and twenties before settling in London. She also entered another religious phase Having moved from Methodism to engaging with high church Anglicanism, she now developed an interest in Christian science. This was a new religion formed in the United States by Mary Baker Eddy. It had common threads with the higher thought movement of Phineas Quimby. These taught essentially that health and spiritual well-being were the same thing, that good physical health followed from a realization of God's imminence. 
The first congregation of the Church of Christian Science in England was close to where Margaret lived in London. She may have been drawn there to be part of that congregation, or she may have discovered it while there. It's actually quite a strange theology, really, you know, that if you're ill, it's because you're not in good standing with God, and if you get back in good standing with God, you'll get better, you know. I wonder, was she thinking about that in herself when she uh, died of dysentery at the age of 44? She was now a teacher in London, having established a small school modelled on Ruskin. She was publishing occasional articles on social issues, and she was mixing with Fabians, other socialists and religious groups. Um, I don't know if any of you heard uh, Samira Ahmed on, uh, uh, oops, sorry, on uh, Radio 4 the other night. She was talking about, um, okay. She was talking about Ruskin's theory that women should divest themselves of the corset and be more free, you know. So when I heard this, I immediately ran to all my photographs of Nevadita to try and work out whether she was wearing a corset. And I think she might be on anyone, any theories on the thought? Anyone got any, you know? Hmm? Not very too hot. Way too hot. <laughs> she was an ascetic. She was supposed to be punishing herself. She was now a teacher in London, having established a small school model in Ruskin. She was publishing occasional articles on social issues, and she was mixing with Fabians, other socialists and religious groups. So a good researcher with time and resources could find some of those articles and find out if she was a suffragette, for instance, because there's nothing that we know of in her writing that suggests she was, but as somebody who's clued into uh, the intellectual scene in London, and uh, including left-wingers, she was surely, surely acquainted with those <coughs> ideas. Her meeting with Swami Vivekananda was not a random event. So we have another look at him. It was not a random event. Margaret was no social butterfly who merely turned up at a friend's house to see an exotic Swami speaking. She was one of a group of active seekers who had heard other writers and religious thinkers address them, who discussed these ideas among themselves and felt they were wrestling with loss of faith. She may have known of Madame Blavatsky's Theosophical Society, uh, itself turning to India for guidance, or the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, of which uh, W.B. Yeats was a member and later Alistair Crowley. Uh, we know from the first chapter of The Master as I Saw Him, Mar uh, Nevedita's book, that she had suffered through loss of religious faith. There in the book she describes herself as having been a skeptic. She suggests that she had already transcended and rejected some theologies. She gives a sense of the variety of friends she had in London and the diversity of their religious thinking. When she describes the group which had invited Swami Vivekananda to address them, she says that they had been selected for their unwillingness to believe. They had come from different religious groupings which were reassessing religious orthodoxies. They included Christian scientists, Christian socialists, some who were interested in Buddhism. Nevadita says that the Christian socialist in the company was the least unconventional. She described the host as having made of an extended psychology the center of her faith. After the first talk, the friends commented to each other that what Vivekananda had said was not new to them. She wrote of her own habit of caution, born of the constant need of protecting the judgment against ill-considered enthusiasm. Ill-considered enthusiasm sounds like something she'd been through before, like some of the rest of us. She had undoubtedly been disillusioned in a previous religious conviction, or she would not have written, and one shrinks from the pain and humiliation of spirit that such experiences involve. Margaret, as Nevedita, later wrote that she believed she had been ripe for decisiveship under Vivekananda because she knew little, though she had hungered for spiritual insight. Always I had this burning voice within, but nothing to utter. How often and often I have sat down pen in hand to speak, and there was no speech, and now there is no end to it. As surely as I am fitted to my world, so surely is my world in need of me, waiting ready. The arrow has found its place in the bow. But if he had not come, if he had meditated on the Himalayan peaks, I for one had never been here. Margaret was keen on her new project, to inspire a Hindu revival in India. And she developed spiritual ideas which accorded with Vivekananda's, but she was more interested in serving the man than in adhering to the Vedanta. People will tell you that's heresy I've just uttered. She says, I saw that although he had a system of thought to offer, nothing of that system would declaim him for a moment if he found that truth led elsewhere. 
And we know from his letters to her in May 1987 that he warned her against becoming emotionally dependent on him. I see people giving me the whole of their love, but I cannot give them all of mine, for that day the work would be ruined. And this hurt her. She had little acquaintance with, other, with men other than his friends and workmates. She had lost her father at nine years old, yet she had many friendships with men. It is easy psychology, but not easily dismissed, to suppose that in Vivekananda she found a father figure to revere. There was a painful tension between Nevadita and her guru, which she wrote about frankly. In that awful time at Almora, when I thought he had put me out of his life contemptuously, it still made no difference to the essentials. Now he is the whole thing, for good or for evil. Instead of growing less, I have grown infinitely more personal in my love. Right? And she kept up a correspondence with the American devotees of Vivekananda, in which she reflected on his divinity in ways which seem sentimental and naive now. If we look at the essentials of Nivedita's life before she went to India, and her preoccupations there when she was at her busiest, we find the one an echo of the other. She did not renounce a way of being. She enhanced it. She felt that she became the person she had been trying to be, pursuing her chief passions, religion and politics, by the same methods as before, journalism and public speaking, and integrating herself into the intellectual circles of the city. She developed a passionate eloquence under the tutelage of Vivekananda, one of the great orators of her time. She took up his project and wrote vigorously to evangelize for the great idea that India could be a nation if it returned to its spiritual roots and that then its claim for independence would become irrefutable. She wrote as an Indian, as a Hindu, let us expect of our own country and our own people the highest and noblest and most progressive outlook that any people in the world might take and in doing this, let us look to become Hindus in a true sense for the first time. This took extraordinary courage from a foreigner appropriating an Indian Hindu identity and claiming to speak for the whole country. And it is not difficult to imagine that she might also have written like this had she stayed in Ireland to call the people back to their ancient traditions, for others did. Another writer, a contemporary, back home in Ireland, was writing similarly aphoristic claims to the oneness of nationalism and spirituality. Patrick Pearce would go on to be a warrior and a willing martyr for the free Ireland he envisaged, walking willingly to the firing squad to make a sacrifice he likened to Jesus Christ's. In the spiritual nation, so similar in tone and argument to the writings of Nevedita, he wrote, Now I think one may speak of a national soul and a national mind. I believe that there is really a spiritual tradition, which is the soul of Ireland, a thing which makes Ireland a living nation. Compare that to Nevedita's words. Like the fire that wraps a forest in flame is the power of the mind of a whole nation. For Pierce, the language of religion was the language of nationalism as he saw it. I do not know if the Messiah has yet come, and I am not sure that there will be any personal or visible Messiah in this redemption. The people itself will perhaps be its own messiah, the people labouring, scourged, crowned with thorns, agonising and dying, to rise again immortal and impassable, for peoples are divine. This does something very similar to what Nevedita's writing did. It appropriates the imagery of the most sacred religious texts, and it makes them contemporary in the 1900s, and relevant, contorts them, of course, and uses them as a vehicle of nationalist passion. Both wanted to invigorate a nation, yet in neither Ireland nor India did their ideas about the oneness of the spirit and the nation prove to be the roadmap for the future. Pierce compared himself to Christ and went meekly to his death as Christ had, but those enthused by his sacrifice to fight on rebuilt an Ireland that found religion to be a cloying restraint and a maturity to be a liberation from church control. And India, as inspired by Vivekananda, Nevadita, and after them Gandhi, adapted to the modern world despite their warnings. And both Ireland and India, incidentally, tragically, exacerbated their own sectarian divisions with their concentration on religion as a defining national characteristic. This year, Ireland celebrated the centenary of the execution of peers, while acknowledging that his dream is unfulfilled and perhaps better left that way too. But few have recognized that Nevadita was stirred at the same time by the same vision in India, and that is partly also because 
Ideas about nations having spiritual destinies have proved to be dangerous ideas in the century since her death. Though Nevedita is remembered as a saintly figure and continued to use the name her guru had given her after his death, she showed a greater interest in journalism and political activism. She worked closely with the scientist Jagdish Chandra Bose, who researched ideas about the sensitivity of plants, and she befriended Rabindranath Tagore, the Bengali poet, who would get the Nobel Prize on the recommendation of W.B. Yeats. She has left a body of letters to friends who include the handsome one, Aurobindo Ghosh, um, uh, yeah. uh, she has left a body of letters to friends who include Aurobindo Ghosh, a Bengali revolutionary who later became a spiritual leader, and there's a story there. Another friend was S.K. Ratcliffe, Samuel uh, Kirkham Ratcliffe, the editor of the Statesman newspaper. A question that hangs over, as I said at the start, is how much she was committed to violent revolution in Bengal. She was a member of a revolutionary committee based at the University of Calcutta at a time when occasional violent attacks were being launched on the British. Aurobindo was arrested for his suspected role in that violence, and for a time Nevadita returned to England and Ireland, probably to keep herself out of the way. She visited Dublin with Bose and said in one of her letters, we are really studying Ireland. Her brother Richmond bought a house in Bally Castle, and she mentions her love of the town and the area around it in her letters. She tried to find work for Vivekananda's brother, who had been released from jail after being held on suspicion of revolutionary activity. When she returned and visited Aurobindo in prison, he told her that he had changed course. He had had a visitation from the spirit of the dead Vivekananda, calling him away from violent revolution to the spiritual path. Aurobindo told her afterwards that the voice of Vivekananda spoke to him for two weeks in his cell. When he was released from prison, Aurobindo fled to French-occupied Pondicherry in southern India and established his own ashram and gathered a following there and wrote his own recondite works on mysticism. We can only guess what effect that may have had on uh, Nevadita. She had, after all, moved away from the life of dedication to Vivekananda towards political activism and journalism and the very kind of life that her dead guru was apparently urging Aurobindo to give up. And I mean, it's no doubt consistent with her own beliefs that Vivekananda had indeed come to Aurobindo. In the following years, she wrote her great tribute to Vivekananda, The Master As I Saw Him, a book in which she describes herself as a docile devotee and in a voice quite unlike that of the ardent Indian nationalism which she, uh, Indian nationalist she'd been. But she had several voices, and you get a sense of them from her letters. The person with whom she shared her harsher political ideas was Ratcliffe, and she even discussed with him the prospect that she might be arrested. She tells Ratcliffe, Denham, chief of the detective force, was honouring me by the assumption that I was the spring of inspiration behind all the dacoities, that's the crimes. I don't suppose now that anyone, even he, really thought so. Elsewhere, she shared some gossip with her journalist friend about a man who reported to the police that another man had behaved too amorously towards the Maharani, sort of thing that was very much frowned upon. Nevedita wrote, It's just like the cad to report instead of fighting a duel. Ugh, I hate a man who doesn't know when to commit murder. <laughs> this is hardly the voice of a demure nun. Nor when she is scurrilous about the Jews. I have been more bitter against it all since we spent a few days at the Hotel Geneva, a gilt palace full of plush furniture and gentlemen with hooked noses feeding themselves to repletion. A very few of that race may have done something for art museums, universities, but for the most part they are worshippers of the flesh. Here her attitude presages exactly what those ideas of national genius would lead to. So I think among the reasons she is not noticed here, her ideas are dated, some of them are cruel, the identification of nations with native religious cultures led to war and genocide in the 20th century after her death, notably in her beloved India. Uh, the need to find new ways of being religious has not proven to be urgent for a lot of people. We have an expanding evangelical culture in our own day which blithely ignores Darwin and archaeology and the fossil record. And many do not see the quest for truth through other religious cultures as a creditable adventure. 
Navadita was hurt that Catholicism could not include her in the way that her Hinduism could include Catholicism, but it couldn't and still doesn't. When I gave a talk on this in Pomeroy the other day, um, I, when I left, I had rosary beads and a holy medal pressed into my hand for fear that I had succumbed to the demonic. And it's true that, yeah. And, uh, and the other thing is she died young. Annie Besant, a contemporary who was engaged in similar work, was born 20 years before her and died 20 years after her. Uh, Nevadita died in 1912 at the age of 44 of blood dysentery and dark healing, though I should reconcile that with Christian science, I'm not sure. Before the first of the calamitous upheavals of that century, before the emergence of Gandhi as the voice for the things that she stood for. And perhaps not only she, but Vivekananda also has been upstaged by Gandhi on the historical record. So there you are, that's a few, that's a bit of a survey. I'm not an expert on Amy Carmichael, but I am kind of good at making documentary films. And I've made quite a lot for the BBC and for UTV over the years. Um, I've made kind of funny films, um, I've made kind of investigative films, and I've made kind of one-off documentaries. I was uh, embedded in um, Ardoin for about four or five months after the Holy Cross row, um, living with the nationalist uh, community. And I became their tame cameraman, which was interesting. I've never eaten so much cake in all my life. Um, I was embedded with the, the Orange Order at Drum Cree for about five months and um, made quite a few friends actually, I was surprised. Um, but when you make a documentary, you're hopefully looking at it from the basis of no knowledge and writing a script that will communicate the story in simple terms to an audience who probably doesn't know anything about it either. So you have to I'm getting a bit of feedback there, a bit of wing round. I'm happy if you're happy, uh, if it's not annoying you. Um, so how did I find out about Amy Carmichael? Well, I got a phone call from an American animation company called uh, Herald Entertainment. And they were looking for a cameraman to film a couple of interviews in a church in Mill Isle. I thought it was quite bizarre, but I'll do anything for money. <laughs> So I said yes, and they said, well, we're bringing our camera with, with us, so I hope you can use it. Because they have a different format in America to us. So anyway, it was the same camera, same buttons, and I was able to do it. But they were making an animation, um, an illustrated animation with some proper interviews in it, uh, about Amy Carmichael, someone who I'd never heard anything about before. The BBC at the same time was looking for ideas to run in its Groundbreakers series, which was going to run on BBC Two. And the BBC uh, were in a very good position because they weren't going to pay all of the money for the documentary because the Ulster Scots Broadcast Fund, which had like millions of quid to spend, was happy to fund um, three quarters of the project. So the BBC, when they heard about the Amy Carmichael story, they said, oh yes, we'll have that. Uh, I then had to get the Ulster Scots Broadcast Fund to back it. Um, they liked it because at that time they would take any Ulster Scot they could and put them on the telly because there wasn't a lot of Ulster Scots stuff on the TV. Plenty of Irish stuff, but not a lot of Ulster Scots stuff. Uh, it has changed now and the Ulster Scots Broadcast Fund will tell the BBC what they regard as proper Ulster Scots programming. I think there's sometimes a wee bit of uh, conflict going on there. Uh, my last idea didn't get off the ground even though the BBC liked it. So the rule used to be if the BBC likes it, the fund will pay for it. So I then thought to myself, well, it makes a fabulous uh, animation, but will it make a TV film and what elements would I need for it? So one of the things I did was uh, I contacted Janet here at uh, Prony and I said, have you got anything on Amy Carmichael? She said, well, actually, we have. We've got a load of stuff. Um, you're welcome to come and see it. And uh, I made an appointment, went through the system here, sat down and got this big box of stuff, uh, which included some amazing things. Um, Amy Carmichael's Bible was in there, heavily annotated by Amy Carmichael. And I was leafing through these pages, and I could see her writing and her colorings. And that was kind of quite a magical moment, because 
even just a book like that can be the basis of a documentary if you build it properly. Inside there, there were also lots of uh, bits and pieces, letters, um, there were <coughs> details about her father, a uh, mill owner in Milan, there were little copies of the letters that she actually wrote within the family called Scraps, which was a sort of precursor to social networking, I suppose. She, they, they had a way of communicating stuff to each other in the family, and they were beautifully colored. They were like little comic books. So I had those. So then I had to say, right, well, we've got some stuff here. What is left of Amy Carmichael in Mill Isle? And actually, hardly anything apart from a blue plaque on a church. I then thought, well, okay, we can do some shots down there. Uh, unfortunately, where the old mill was is now a sort of a luxury apartment <coughs> development, um, but right on sea. So then I said, right, okay, well, we can do the Northern Ireland then. What about the Carmichael kind of connection? Who are the Car Carmichaels? So I phoned up the chief of the clan Carmichael in the lowlands of Scotland and said, I'm thinking of making a documentary. Would you be interested in being in it and tell me a bit about how the Carmichaels ended up in Northern Ireland, or Ireland as it was then. And he said he'd be happy to do that as long as I took uh, a B&B in one of his little cottages. <laughs> <laughs> so he stayed there for two nights and boosted his coffers, but he was very good. And he took us up to some of the old um, historic uh, ruins on his estate. So that was good. Um, I then thought, have we got any academics in Northern Ireland who would know about women, uh, prominent women in society, <coughs> historic figures? And I found someone who could do that. Um, I also found that the church that Amy Carmichael started, or sort of a mission hall, um, was actually still there, although it was a modern version, but it was still there in Cambria Street off the Shankill Road. And the man who was in charge of it uh, Pastor uh, Jonathan Clark was happy to be part of the research. So with all this in mind, I then had to think, well, I've got to do the Indian end of the story. How am I going to do that? And would you believe it, I had my tickets booked to fly to India on the 8th of January, and on December the 24th, I still didn't have my visa or permission to film in India. That was a heart-stopping moment jumped on the plane, got to the Indian embassy and managed to get the piece of paper I needed. After that, it was a question of, you know, uh, getting out there and, uh, and making a film. We didn't really know what we were going to find. We knew that the orphanage Amy started way back in at the early 1900s was still there. We didn't know what form it would be in and whether, you know, the idea of uh, bringing Hindu children up as Christians was still, you know, a possible thing to do in India. Um, so basically, uh, I'm going to show you the film. It's 29 minutes long. It's a potted history of Amy Carmichael. There's quite a lot of detail that you might like to have known about that's not in it. But by the very token of TV documentaries, you've got to keep it tight and hit the main points and make it as interesting and entertaining as possible. Um, TV is, is literally a vehicle for one type of information. If you want detail, you can go to a library, you can come here, you can read it in a newspaper. TV, you know, just hits the headlines. I'm not an expert on Amy Carmichael, but I do have a good knowledge about her now. And uh, the, the, the visit we made to India did change me a wee bit, I've got to say that. Me, a hard, tough, roughy, tufty journalist, I, I was actually quite touched by it. So um, I'll let you see it and make your own mind up. After I play it, I've got some uh, images that didn't make the documentary which will show you some things that we found in India that nobody had seen before, which is quite, quite good fun. So, I'll just play it, and uh, can we dim the lights a wee bit? That's what Ryan Seacrest says in uh, American Idol, dim the lights. <laughs> if you want that. Imagine a world so utterly different to anything else you've ever been used to. Imagine trying to preach your religious beliefs in a place where the mere sight of it causes people to stop and stare. A place in an era where it was sometimes acceptable for young girls to be sold or given into a life of sex workers. This is Southern India 
where a young Ulster woman caused major upset and controversy over a hundred years ago. I'm Mark Cullen, former chief of the BBC's office in Delhi, and I'm on a journey to discover more about a remarkable woman known simply as Amma. This is the story of the famous Ulster missionary from Milan, Amy Carmichael. Here is Amy Carmichael's legacy, a children's home, schools and a hospital in Tamil Nadu, 30 miles from the southernmost tip of India. A hundred years ago, it was a place of refuge for girls in physical and moral danger. Amy was determined to challenge a Hindu tradition at the time, where some young women, known as Devadasis, were kept inside temples as dancers. They were never allowed to marry, but instead were dedicated to a goddess, and all too often were sexually abused by rich landlords, patrons of the temples, and also by the priests. These children are sent into a little room where the priests come to them in the night, and the children tremble. There were many children who need to be rescued she felt that in her heart. We had one that was under a cactus hedge, another one on a river bed, another one that was found on a bus station, another one from found in a train. We'll be finding out how Amy Carmichael made the journey from Milan to South India. And we'll show you, for the very first time on television, a unique photographic collection that's been hidden from sight for more than 50 years. Memories, sweet memories of Amy. Our story starts in the late 17th century in Scotland. Amy's ancestors were about to join the Exodus, known as the Plantation of Ulster. Richard, you're the chief of the Clan Carmichael. How did the clan come to be? This is a geographic name source, and we are standing on the original church, which was established by Queen Margaret in the year 1076, to the Archangel, St. Michael. And the Care, which was the old Gallic hill fort, and the Michael made the name Care Michael. The people of the district took the name Carmichael and migrated over the centuries from this. And became okay. Clan Carmichael. And became Clan Carmichael. And, and Richard, then how did those Carmichaels get to us? There were 22 Carmichael families from Lanarkshire and East Ayrshire who were devout covenanters around the 1680s, 1690s, and we think they were given land and with, uh, new futures in Ulster. Now, one of course the most famous descendants of those is Amy Carmichael. How important is she to you and to Carmichael's? Well, she was one of the half dozen Carmichael's I credited with having had the most influence um, on the world during the thousand years that just ended. Very proud of her. Very, very proud of her. Amy's ancestors settled in the County Down village of Millai. It's a place described today as an unpretentious bucket and spade resort of fish and chip shops and acres of caravans. Amy was the eldest of seven children brought up in a deeply religious, God-fearing family. It was by all accounts an idyllic childhood in a village where the flour mills owned by Amy's father David provided jobs for many of the locals. There's little trace now of the mills which once looked across the Irish Sea. This blue plaque is all that remains of Amy in Milan. I'm here with Alison McCacken, who has written about Amy. Alison, what do we know about her Milan days? Amy would have been brought up in an atmosphere of faith and trust and an understanding that her faith and God underpinned all that the family did. 
she was also a, very much a leader, wasn't she? She was the eldest child, but she was the one who got them all into scrapes. Yes, she? she was enthusiastic. She was uh, up for things. On one occasion, uh, she stuffed her two brothers out through the skylight of the family home, and they slid down the slates, and much to the astonished parents uh, below. Amy's father moved his milling business from Millal to Belfast Docks, and within sight of these iconic shipyard cranes is a place where Amy's story really starts to unfold. I'm in the public record office in the Titanic Quarter to see their Amy Carmichael collection. Open search for David Carmichael, who is Amy's uh -huh. father. Oh, now we can see all the papers which were available there. When your table number comes up in one of the blue screens down the room, we'll know the relic, and then we'll go to the reading room. So, Janet, what have you managed to find for us? Well, the first thing I wanted to show you is is this lease, and it's for Mills in Malau, and it's for Robert Carmichael, and it dates back to 1790. Um, so this really puts the Carmichael family associated with the mills in Malau, which we know is correct. This is a family register which we found in the archive and it lists <coughs> David Carmichael, Amy's father, and Catherine Jane Filson, who was his wife. And it lists when all the children were born, including up at the top there we've got Amy Beatrice, who was born on the 16th of December 1867. And how many children are there here? Uh, there are seven children listed, and also at the bottom it, it lists an eighth baby which was stillborn in 1877. Scraps was a family journal, um, and this is the first edition of Scraps in 1887. And if you like a precursor to social media, they were circulated throughout the family and they were meant to be points of discussion for entertainment and amusement. And you can see their hand drawing. Draw and there are, there's lots of illustrations oh, and pictures yes, yes. and stories. Um, they were designed to be a, a talking point amongst the family. So now we go to India, Mark, and he, this material relates to Amy's time there. And the first thing I want to show you is really special. It's Amy's own Bible. It's a wonderful looking Bible. It is, uh, and it's particularly special because it's been hand annotated throughout by Amy herself. And with such care as well, all these different colours in the underlining. And they all relate to different themes, which I expect she used in her teachings. Um, Mark, I just want to show you this particular piece where it talks about Peter's calling, and it seemed to resonate with Amy because in the, in the margin she's annotated that everything depends on that if and he said come. And that seems to relate to her own calling because she then details her own missionary work and dates where she went to different places. Where she goes, she was told to come. It, it would appear that way. And here, Mark, we have some really interesting photographs. And Amy was once in them, but as you can see, bits have been obscured and she's no longer there. She's been cut out there and she's had a hole punched through her face there. Yeah, and, and it would seem that Amy did this herself because she really did not like to be in the spotlight. A remarkable act of humility. Really. Indeed. This is the Shankill Road in West Belfast where Amy started to work, helping the Shoreys, the poor young mill girls. Here in Canberra Street in West Belfast is a lovely tribute to Amy. And the man to tell me about it is Jonathan Clark. Jonathan, this tribute marks the place where Amy started her work, doesn't it? It is indeed, Mark. And um, if you can imagine it was 1888, and this area was saturated uh, with mill girls going to their place of employment. They were working uh, 10 hour shifts in very poor conditions, receiving very little pay. Uh, and these girls were quite poor, and she just had a real interest in these girls. And she built a tin shack, didn't she, where she could meet all these little girls? She did indeed, Mark. In fact, that's where my church is now. Amy called it the Tin Tabernacle. That was the nickname for it. Was there a th 
turning point in Amy's life, do you think? There was, yes. One day in Belfast, she had an encounter with God, an experience that was life-changing for her. Out of the crowd, there came this little woman who was carrying a heavy bundle. And she was quite hunched over, very dirty. Um, and basically, the people just walked past her, ignored her. But Amy and her two brothers stopped to help this lady. Really, that particular day was life-changing for Amy because she went home and she prayed. Obviously, she thought about this lady and she really settled once and for all that afternoon what she wanted to do for the rest of her life. Helping the Shawnees and influenced by evangelical preachers led Amy to believe that God wanted her to become a missionary. To understand more about Amy's desire to help others, I met Dr. Myrtle Hill, who's an expert on Irish missionaries. Amy wasn't really a typical missionary, was she? No, she wasn't uh, at all. Um, this was a period when single woman missionaries were really just getting underway from, by the 1870 onwards. And I've looked at the Presbyterian uh, missionary women who went to India and China and so forth at the end of the 19th century. And she really does stand out as someone entirely different. Amy was, of course, driven, wasn't she, by a profound sense that God was telling her what to do. She was, uh, and I really think that that's what gave her a sense of power, if you like. Uh, the idea that God was speaking directly to her um, meant that she felt she must obey, and it broke no opposition from anyone else. It's time for me to leave West Belfast to travel halfway across the world to the Indian state of Tamil Nadu, where Amy started her crusade against what, all those years ago, she described as child trafficking. It's hard to imagine a more striking contrast to the life Amy left behind in Ulster. Historically, India has provided a home for almost all the great religions of the world. Many believe that it was St. Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples, who first brought Christianity here. Amy Carmichael didn't have much time for religious labor, but when she first came here in 1895, she was absolutely convinced that those people the missionaries called the heathen of India needed Christianity for salvation. <coughs> and that led her to a head-on clash with Hinduism. Since independence, India has taken various measures to improve the status of women. There's been a woman prime minister, and the present chief minister of this state is a woman. But there's still a lot to be done. It's widely admitted that too many women still face threats to their life including the threat of sexual violence. And that, sadly, has been borne out by recent headlines. As dusk fell across the mountains known as the Western Guards, the children's home Amy built in the early 1900s came into view. And there was a welcoming committee waiting for me. These are the adults, teenagers and children who to this day still follow Amy Carmichael's way of life and worship. The next morning a familiar melody rang out around the tranquil estate of red brick bungalows. Built gradually over 30 years, today it provides a home and a place of refuge for more than 300 people. On the last stage of her journey for Ireland, Amy Carmichael travelled in a vehicle like this, a pull-up car. And I can assure you, it is not first class. The vehicle isn't sprung at all. And the road would have been a track like this, full of potholes. So Amy would have had a very bumpy ride. She arrived wearing a solar topi like this to protect her from the sun. And all the villagers thought she was a sun until, to their utter amazement, they discovered that she was wearing a sari. 
This is how Amy went from village to village with her Indian converts, a band of evangelizing women who became known locally as the Starry Cluster. It was in 1901 that Amy Carmichael first became aware of the perils facing some children. Uh, when Amma was uh, roaming around in the village telling the gospel, one day a child came to her while she was having breakfast and she hugged her and said, I don't want to go back to that place. What is the place, Amma had asked. She said, the temple. I don't want to go there. I'm frightened. Only through her, Amma had heard about this Devadasi system and she was shocked. And Amma started investigating about this. And uh, Amma never wanted to let her go from her. And she also hugged her and said, Amma, I want to be with you. I don't want to go back to that place. Sura, the current leader of the Donovan Fellowship, was left by her mother in the care of this children's home. She shed more light on why children were given to the temples. Mothers uh, who wanted um, favor from their God, uh, they thought they will give the best, maybe the firstborn, to the temple where the child will be brought up. The child was um, abused uh, by the priests there and it was a life, very, very sad life she had and they couldn't get out in case uh, they, um, the mother would get a curse. I mean, that's what she gave the child for. Amy had brown eyes, so she put coffee powder on her face and went to the temple as a Brahmin woman. And so she was able to get first-hand knowledge about this. So what happened, what used to happen to these women eventually? These women were uh, discarded or cast out out of the temple. Then they had nowhere to go to. They were living under the bridge and they were living on the streets. They were not accepted by the companies or even as a house servant. And people were afraid to touch them. So they had a very miserable poor life. But now we don't see that kind of thing happening. The government is very much on the lookout to help these people. While Amy tried to reach temple girls, other children were also at risk. Amy did not only take babies from temples, from all sorts of dangerous situations, like children not wanted in the family uh, because they are illegitimate or um, they are fifth style, you know, baby girl. They say it's bad omen. Amy, I looked after them. Locally, there was fierce opposition to Amy's crusade. She was accused of using witchcraft to lure children away from their Indian families. There were protests and sometimes violence as more and more children arrived to find <laughs> shelter and were converted to Christianity. At Donovan. Boys were also accepted for a time. <coughs> this is a rare photograph of Amy that we've uncovered. While Amy actively encouraged arranged marriages for her girls when they were old enough, <coughs> many have come back to live out the remainder of their lives here. Okay, Namaskar, Namaskar. I'm Mark Tully. My name is Mark Tully. Oh, Mark. And uh, I've come to find out all about Amma. Could you tell us some stories? I go to Amma every day. And she comes me and kisses me and gives me some sweets. At night, I sit beside her. I have to read John's Gospel, chapter 14. Until I hear her snoring, I read it, and after I stop it. With that snoring, she goes to sleep. John's chapter 14. Amy is the inspiration of my life, because she inspired me uh, in a way, in a lot of ways. My uh, young age uh, watched Amy only, 
And you live still with her express. Memories, sweet memories of Amy. It's wonderful to meet these elderly women. Their whole lives have been inspired by Amy. And here they are, still smiling, still happy, still with those wonderful memories, and of course still being very well looked after by the fellowship that Amy founded. She loves old old family. Now amongst children spread all over the bread. Okay girls, we are going to sing this song about Amy's blue eyes. She wanted blue eyes because her mother had blue eyes. Amy had brown eyes. Pasanta Kumari, or Vacha as she's known, works as the charity's education coordinator. She too was brought to Donova as a child. So how do you feel now about uh, Amy and about uh, being a part of the Donova family? I've heard many things about uh, Amy and uh, I like the way she stood for the right thing. Now, after I met my biological parents, I feel how privileged I am to be here because I'm from a Hindu Brahmin family. My father is still a temple priest. So I'm very proud and happy that I'm here. I met them, I was emotionally upset for some time. You must have been very upset, weren't you? Yes, because I was, at that moment I thought, why did they bring me to that to this place? I was called an orphan by many people. But after some time, after a week or so, I felt very, very glad and happy to be part of this family. Uh, I, I've got a very good uh, husband, a good family. I love to live with my in-laws. I'm so proud. I'm the happiest wife of uh, my very good husband. <laughs> Nobody could get a very good family, I think. Well, that's a very good testimony to your husband, to Donova, and to Amy, yes. isn't it? Amy's missionary work was funded at first by the Church of England. But as news of her work spread, she attracted donations and legacies, which allowed her to buy her own land and property. Thatcher's husband, Jerry, is in charge of food production here. As the number of children started growing, Amy felt the need for growing more and more food. So she started buying raw land. So that's how we end up with all this lovely agricultural land. But was she interested particularly in the environment and in agriculture? Yeah, she was a very ardent naturalist. And in fact, she was far ahead of her times in spreading the message of conservation. And if you go through her writings and the poems, you can see how she loved nature and how she also wanted her children to love nature and respect the other living beings. Near the children's home, deep in the jungle, Amy was able to buy an old coffee plantation to provide holidays for her growing Indian family. It's an exhausting <laughs> four-hour trek to get there, and it's not without its dangers. Tigers are known to live here. Wild elephants roam at will, bulldozing their way through the undergrowth. Monkeys watch from the trees. And you have to stay alert for snakes. Not to mention anything that might be lurking in the canopy. The idyllic stone lodges are surrounded by the jungle with all its different sounds. This is now one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. And here, in Amy's first jungle log book, is advice to visitors if they encounter any native species. Uh, she had clearly written that uh, you don't run away when you encounter a tiger or elephant. Just wait for them to pass away because they don't come out of the way to chase us. But if they don't seem to be moving, then slowly retrace your step backwards until you are out of sight, then run for your life. <laughs> <laughs> Amy Carmichael changed so many lives in her quest to bring Christianity to this part of India. But the pace of her work had weakened her health. Change was forced on Donova in 1931, when disaster struck. Amy fell into a hole and broke her ankle. She was confined to her room for the rest of her life. 
and Amy's room is preserved today, a tranquil library, a time capsule. And it's easy to imagine Amy sitting here campaigning for tougher legislation to outlaw the sale of children for immoral purposes. In one article Amy wrote about David Assis, she said, the training of the child all but ensures its moral degradation. That special training is sufficient to obliterate all look of innocence from the face of a little girl. She wrote dozens of books still in circulation today. Queen Mary heard of Amy's work and she was included in the Royal Birthday Honours List. David Assis was outlawed once India became independent. Today, the Donover family's medical needs and those of local villagers are cared for within the grounds. The facilities are modern, a far cry from the way the charity's doctors helped to save lives not too long ago. The need is there, but there are not much babies now because the present government has uh, not given us permission to admit babies anymore. So we are admitting children above five years of age. Do a lot of children suffer from simply from neglect because the girl child is not as respected as the boy child? Yes, it's still there yes, in India. I still feel that our children who are deprived, that they do need affection. Families who are too poor to keep them, they need food, education, need to be able to survive. People who are orphaned, accidents, life expectancy, all these things mean that our children in need. And we do hope we'll be able to care for them for a long time to come. Amy's grave has no headstone. This simple bird bath marks the place where she was buried. And that's appropriate because Amy loved birds and said they reminded her of the love of God. Amy died in 1951, but her legacy still lives on in the hundreds of families founded by her children who've gone out into the world. Some have stayed by. It touched you a little bit, the way it touched me when I was making it, because I found it an amazing experience. And, and one moment, um, it was shot by me and, and my son Adam. Um, and Adam got very ill, he got very bad sinusitis. And uh, after two days of being in pain, he was lying in the wee bungalow that we were staying in. And um, I thought, if we were back home, what would I be doing now? I thought, well, we should take him to hospital. It was a four hour drive. To, to the nearest town, and um, all these um, sisters, Protestant sisters, stood around the car, and they just prayed for him. It was such an amazing moment, because I'm not a particularly religious person, but um, I just felt he was going to be okay, and uh, we did the drive, went to the local town, saw a GP for £1.50, <laughs> got a full CT scan and blood test and an appointment with a specialist within three hours. The whole thing cost £19. And in a shambolic, what appears to be a shambolic country, 
they had this amazing system, and if you had the money, you know, you could be looked after, basically. So he then came back to Donovan with me, and we carried on filming. Um, but it, but it, was, it was quite an amazing experience. And I do think that their, their thoughts and wishes really helped his recovery, because he was really, really un unconscious for, for about a day. And that, that sort of moment. So that's a nice moment for us, anyway. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of uh, stills from the production. Um, some things that we, could, we couldn't get into the program. <coughs> It was only 29 minutes, and you know, it, 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 it really is just touching the surface. But I've got some black and whites here, uh, which I can talk you through. There is the uh, mill aisle with the, with the old mill. Um, sadly, it doesn't exist anymore apart from the remnants of the old walls. Um, it's another view of it with the, the, the ponds that they had uh, constructed slightly up from the main road. Um, Here's some uh, black and whites of some of the original children. There's Amy in her room, uh, that beautiful room. That had a presence in itself, the one where we filmed the, the reenactment of Amy writing. Um, this was uh, a very famous still of Amy with two of the, the, the first girls she looked after. And that was the one we reenacted in the film and did a sort of a, a mix through to a, the, the, the colour sequence. Um, a lot of people will be familiar with that uh, picture of Amy, um, with her girls uh, on a, a trip to the seaside. Uh, because she got so much money from you know um, London and other parts of England, uh, people who were supporting her, she was able to buy a holiday house by the seaside, and she bought that coffee plantation up in the jungle. That was a four and a half hour trek up there, but it's still there to this day. And um, they use it for holiday outings for the children, which is quite lovely. Um, that's her in a sidecar. You saw that in the film. Um, that is Prina, the very first child who was rescued uh, from the temple. Um, they took boys up until quite recently, uh, but they found <laughs> they found the boys were too disruptive at the orphanage, so they, <laughs> so they stopped doing that. Um, that's Amy, Amy with Prina. Um, that's the uh, special little garden they had for uh, having some fun. And you can see there's some, maybe not that one, but there, they did have swings and slides and, and traditional things that Amy would have had back, back home in Northern Ireland. She brought all that to these children. Now, there's some swings there, though. Um, there's the bullock cart and the Western Ghats, the mountain range, which runs sort of parallel to the to the coast, uh, which is basically where they were. The climate was really quite good for Amy because when she was a missionary in Japan, she got very ill. She suffered from neuralgia. The climate didn't really suit her. But when she went to India via Ceylon, as it was then known, she found that the climate here, 30 miles from, up from the coast, really suited her. Beautiful, beautiful countryside, and still just like that today. <laughs> Amy was a very, very powerful woman, and if she didn't like somebody, she got rid of them, basically, <laughs> from what I found. She didn't take any nonsense, and uh, if you didn't tow Amy's line, you, you were out, basically. Uh, but but she kind of was was fair as well, and she um, she basically expected people to be loyal to her and to support her because of you know what she was bringing. And if you can imagine it, you know she was a woman who chose not to have children or, or, or get married, um, and she had an orphanage full of these beautiful beautiful babies that she and and, and all the other ladies could. The nuns, they were Protestant nuns, they could look after her as well. So it was a, it was a wonderful place for Amy. She, she got a lot of, a lot of pleasure from it, and deeply, deeply believed she was, you know, doing the right thing. The locals were, as the film said, very suspicious of her. She did end up in court one time because she, she found a child who was at risk. Um, got the child brought to Donovan. The parents wanted the child back. 
um, she wouldn't give the child back and the child got whisked off to China to another missionary family. <laughs> so she ended up in court over that, but luckily the case was dropped against her. That was a, a still of Amy that nobody knew existed. And we, we dug through all these old, old bookcases. That's the Keswick uh, Convention, where she very first of all got into the kind of idea of becoming um, a missionary. I'll just move on to the, uh, the colored stills. We found a whole pile of stills there that uh, nobody knew existed, not even the people running um, Donovan, we got them to, they found Amy's bed, <coughs> because we said we wanted a bed for the sequence in, in, in the room, and they actually found that there was a, a, an elderly lady, an Akka as they're called, who actually was sleeping on Amy's bed, so she got turfed out of the bed, <laughs> <laughs> so we could have the bed for the film. And they also found um, two of Amy's nighties, one had been uh, ripped up for dusters, but another one was intact, and we were able to dress the, the actress in that self-same nighty, which was quite amazing. So there's the starry cluster, uh, a, coloured, a coloured slide of the evangelising kind of women wandering from village to village. Um, the hospital unit, which still exists today. That's the House of Prayer, beautiful building. Bonnie rabbits. Um, they were able to afford proper agricultural machinery and they provided all the food for the, for the orphanage. That's the colour still of the reenactment we did. Getting the little girl at the, standing up at the back to stay still was quite a trial, but we did get it in the end. It was a good shot. There's some of the boys sleeping uh, <laughs> on a rather hard, cold floor. Nobody knew these slides existed till we arrived, and uh, we redigitized them for the the fellowship, and now they have a proper proper copy of them. So she was born in the same year as Nevadita, but she was exactly. By 40 years. And you mentioned Keswick in your uh, talk, and. Oh, clearly a big influence. Um, I'll show you some uh, production stills. Um, we attracted a lot of attention in that part of India. In fact, when we arrived at the airport, people were asking could they be photographed beside us because they'd never <laughs> seen such big white blokes before. <laughs> really was quite, quite interesting. A bit embarrassing, but we did it. Um, so that's filming in a, in a market. Um, there's the Akers with, with Mark, and we were very lucky to find those ladies who, st who had a memory of Amy, because uh, of course Amy died in 1951, so it was fabulous to find them. Amazing characters. You know. We did an interview with these ladies, uh, they were young students, kind of. 15, 16 year olds, <laughs> none of them spoke English. But the fellowship was so keen to help us that when we said we wanted to do some interviews, they wheeled in these four ladies and uh, Mark kept on asking questions and they just hadn't got a clue what he was talking about. <laughs> so we, we filmed for another 10 minutes just to be polite and then we moved on. <laughs> um, we took uh, with, the t with us um, a whole pile of uh, yo-yos as a present and these children never seen yo-yos before, so we spent a couple of hours un untangling yo-yos for them. Um, you saw a sequence where we had the bullet cart. Well, there's Adam, my son, with a Steadicam camera, and uh, he's having to go between a prickly cactus and a bullock. <laughs> um, we didn't envisage that when we were going to be filming in, in such a hazardous position, but he was up for it, and he didn't get hurt. <laughs> luckily, but he had to do a backtrack shot in front of those bullocks as well, but luckily they were very classy. But it was it made a very nice sequence there. 
Um, there's Mark and the bullet driver. They use those uh, rigs for uh, football matches, as you've probably seen them on the touchlines. Def you definitely get a sore back after a few years of doing that. So Mark Tully, of course, was the chief of the BBC's India Bureau. And when we mentioned Mark Tully's name to the immigration people, um, we didn't have any problem getting into the country. They were so delighted to have him back. It's a steady cam rig. That's getting ready for one of the reenactments. More of the bullet cart. Got to play Prina. Getting into the, uh, the Hindu temple was, was amazingly easy. I thought we weren't going to be allowed to, but uh, uh, one of the people at the fellowship had very good contacts with his Hindu pals and allowed us in. And uh, as soon as we walked in through those doors, a cow walked straight out. It was a surreal moment. <laughs> Amazing faces. When we were heading uh, up into the jungle to film Amy's um, coffee plantation holiday residence, all the um, uh, loadsmen helpers, um, they were wearing flip-flops and shorts and bare legs and me and Adam were wearing thorn-proof trousers and boots. <laughs> we felt quite weedy, actually, in comparison to them. And they were carrying all our gear on their heads. And this was going great, because normally we have to carry it all. And uh, halfway up the track, about two hours in, we found some elephant droppings. And the lead loadsman put the back of his hand on, on the, the elephant droppings and said uh, that we were okay through the interpreter. We were okay that the elephant droppings were were cold and it was probably two days old. And don't worry. So we carry on walking, and then about 20 minutes later, all our kit was dropped on the floor, and these guys ran past us. <laughs> and um, there were three elephants just ahead around the, around the bend, and they'd seen these elephants. And elephants in India are um, there's a love-hate relationship with elephants in India. Attention, please. No documents will be issued after 4.15 p.m. Okay. It will be appreciated if documents no longer required are returned to the issue desk as soon as possible. Thank you for your cooperation. So, when these guys ran past us and we were left standing, didn't really know what had happened, we uh, then deduced that there was danger up the track and I kind of popped my head on the boulder and I could see the elephants. And I said to Adam, quick, grab the tripod, which is an instinct we have in our business. We must get a shot at it. And he said, no, Dad, no. He said, this is dangerous. This is seriously dangerous. If these guys have run down the track, we should be running as well. I said, look, Adam, you know, I've, I've worked in Belfast. I can cope with that. <laughs> so, I did get the shot, he didn't help me. I grabbed the tripod, grabbed the camera, got the shot. I felt like David Attenborough. You did the right thing. I think I did. <laughs> but I got such a roasting from him afterwards because apparently when an elephant chases you, the only way to escape an elephant is to run down an incline because they won't chase you down that. But there weren't any inclines where we were, so we, we could have got trampled, but luckily we didn't and we had to tell another tale. So that, that's, uh, that's it from me, really. If uh, anyone's got any brief questions, happy to, to field them. Um, I'm a retired judge uh, from England. Um, I have a background in child protection um, and I sat in three different jurisdictions. Special Educational Needs, Care Standards, which is about all the regulatory bodies, um, everything from paedophiles to care homes and everything in between. And I also did Social Security, which is welfare benefits. So I had a kind of a portfolio judicial career. And when I retired, my husband said, what on earth are you going to do? And I thought, I might write about the women that I've worked with. 
because as a result of uh, being chair of the Association of Lawyers for Children for about five years, I came into contact not only with civil servants and some wretched po politicians, um, but I also came worked with a number of leading women who are themselves first in the law. People like Brenda Hale, um, Elizabeth Butler Sloss, and I felt that their stories might well be lost if somebody didn't get hold of them, as so many stories of women lawyers have been lost in the past. So I thought I'd write a few mini biographies. Well, unfortunately, the project has grown and grown and grown. <laughs> and whilst I can't replace what you're expecting, we were expecting to hear, um, Des felt that I might be better than nothing at all. <laughs> My ability to make specific links between Irish women and India is confined to this woman. Is anybody She's my great aunt? Is she? <laughs> oh, fantastic! Uh, this, now, is, this is her book that she wrote with her husband. Oh. Now out of print. <laughs> My entire fortnight in Ireland has been spent finding these treasures. <laughs> the, the second woman to be called to the bar in Ireland used to live in Greystones, south of, of Dublin. I went to see the house and the owner said, My father has some papers of Avril Devils that were found underneath the floorboards. And he's kept them because he thought they might be important. Important! <laughs> you can imagine. Uh, I, I mean, I could tell you loads of stories about it. You in Ireland seem to hoard treasure. <laughs> anyway, this woman, as this gentleman will know, is the Belfast woman who, in 1908, co founded the Women's the Irish Women's Franchise League with Hannah Sheehy Skeffington. In 1910, she was one of six Dublin women at the Parliament of Women, which attempted to march to the House of Commons to hand a resolution to the Prime Minister and got herself arrested and sentenced to a month in Holloway Prison when they started breaking windows. But in 1915, she moved to India with her husband and Having heard W.B. Yeats read translations of poems by Rabindranath Tagore in 1912 when she would happen to be on holiday with W.B. Yeats, yeah, it's kind of a cool thing to be, um, she composed the tune for the Indian National Anthem. And I didn't know that until I went to India last year. I don't quite know how I didn't know, but I didn't. She was the first non-Indian member of the Indian Women's University at Pune. In 1917, she co-founded the Women's Indian Association with Annie Besant and Dorothy... Uh, and I'm not going to... Thank you. I'm glad you got there before me. And she edited the WIA's journal. Um, and she also became the first head of the National Girls' School at Mangalore. In 1927, she co-founded the All India Women's Conference, which she became president in 1936, which is the oldest national women's organization in India. And her attention had been caught earlier by a couple of articles in the month monthly magazine she was responsible for editing by Mrs. A.L., and I'm going to mispronounce this, Heidekerper from Ireland. I'm not quite sure how I relate those two, but anyway, who'd been teaching in Batoon College in Calcutta. And that article had been prompted by the Director of Public Instruction in Bengal at a prize giving ceremony at the college who called on women who alone can help adequately to remedy what is wrong in women's education, to tell us with one voice what they want and keep on telling us until they get it. He was one of that small band of men who actually thought it was all right for women to get on, um, as I have found in the history. The second conference in 1928 
uh, resolved on compulsory primary education for girls. And in 1930, in a precursor to today, the conference chose March the 1st to popularise and explain its work by holding meetings in all of its branches. And it, called, it, it was called the Women's Day in India. But I'm interested in her because in 1922, she became the first woman magistrate in India. And that's before we had any women in judicial positions in England. The history that I've been looking at includes another woman, Cornelia Sarabji. Does anybody know who she was? She's the first woman to read law at an English university in 1892. She was assisted by a group of English friends uh, to come from Bombay. She's a, a Parsi Christian from Bombay. Um, and the group of friends included the Hobhouses, um, Lady Hobhouse in particular, who, who organised a scholarship for her to come to Somerville College in Oxford and to study there to, um, to get a, a law degree, because of course they didn't give degrees to women. They allowed them to study, but they didn't give degrees. And she came over and she duly got her, her law degree and she went back to India and she has a fascinating career um, fighting for women in Purdah. I won't go into her history, it's far too long, it's very complicated, but while she was in Somerville, in her memoirs, she does talk about meeting Irish women students, um, one or two in particular. So she's clearly very, and she was very fascinated by Irish myth and legend. Um, and she said that it, that inspired her in her later work. I haven't tracked through exactly what the myths and legends were that she took with her to India, but she was definitely interested in, uh, in India. Could I just ask you, I have a photograph here of Margaret sitting on the bench. Have you seen it? I have not. I'd be very grateful to you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. It'll cost you, but... Uh, <laughs> Oh, it costs dear to do all this research. <laughs> no, she, she's sitting there in 1923. Fantastic. Because so many of these photographs have been lost. So many of them have appeared in, in newspapers and the originals have gone. Lafayette, the, the photographers in uh, Dublin who took a lot of photographs of the early women graduates from Trinity College and subsequently took photographs of um, some of the, uh, the women who entered the legal profession, had a very serious fire in the 1950s, and the archive is gone. So just like the stories, the photographs have gone as well. Anyway, right. Um, Cornelia um, says in her memoirs, um, I often lunched and dined at the speaker's house in the thrilling days of the Irish home rule controversy, tasting the whole of it. I remember asking at one of these House of Commons parties, she, she was very well connected, this woman, uh, what I should read in order to understand the Irish situation. The answer came from Mr Balfour, the real Charlotte, it tells you all that is material about Ireland. I, I don't know what the real Charlotte is. A, a it's it's, a, it's uh, Somerville and Ross. Oh, it's Somerville and Ross, right. Okay, you can tell I haven't checked my sources yet. <laughs> okay. The stories of women in the law, and this woman didn't get her degree until 1930, and she had to come back to England to get it. She was refused a degree in, in um, India as well. Stories of Women in the Law is littered with refusals to let women into the legal profession from about the mid-19th mid century right the way through to 1939 because they weren't persons. Now the connections with suffragism and the vote are obvious in that, that comment because women weren't seen as persons for the purpose of voting. So they 
to some extent, the, the, the men translated that into preventing women in, in getting into the profession. Um, but they used a variety of excuses, including, in one case, the fact that it wasn't custom and practice for women to be lawyers, um, and in what sounded to me like a desperate act of scrabbling, they had to go back to Rome um, to show that women weren't accepted as advocates in Rome, and therefore they couldn't be advocates in uh, 1912 South Africa because they hadn't been advocates in between. Um, these judges didn't know their history. Uh, but they, in that particular case, they used um, an excuse that the Rome, uh, Roman women had been barred from being advocate, be advocates because a woman called Carthania um, had offended the praetors. Actually, offending the praetors involved burying her bottom at them, which I thought was a pretty good way of telling them they were being jolly stupid. Once these women were actually managed to get into the legal profession, there were arguments over issues such as the wearing of wigs, the availability of toilets. You can imagine women in some chambers didn't get pupillages in some chambers on the basis that there weren't any toilets in, in chambers, so therefore they couldn't have women in. Smacks of most extraordinary excuses. The timeline is pretty extraordinary. In 1869, Oxford and Cambridge um, made local examinations available to women. They were seen as girls' degrees. In the same year, Arabella Mansfield became the first woman lawyer in the English-speaking world in the States. In 1870, Girton College in Cambridge opened, but it wasn't recognised by the university authorities, and Trinity College established special exams for women. Beginning to get a bit of a theme going on here. Um, in 1877, two women, one of whom Carrie Morrison um, was the first solicitor in England, graduated from Girton with first class honours, but were refused degrees. In 1880, the first three women were granted degrees by a British university. The University of London was remarkably enlightened when it came to women, um, and did actually give them degrees. In 1889, Ireland scores its first triumph, because Letitia Walkington is awarded a law degree from Trinity College, Dublin. She's the first woman law graduate in Ireland and the UK. But she came, uh, sorry, she wasn't awarded Trinity College, she was awarded uh, uh, the Royal University of Ireland, because Trinity weren't getting degrees at that stage. The women graduates were allowed um, from that year in Scotland, and that was the year that Cornelia arrived in, in England. Ivy Williams, the first English barrister, got a law degree from London University in 1903, but the Oxford regulations did not allow her to matriculate. In 1904, Ireland scores its second first because it opens its doors to women after a 30-year fight. And in a, one of those interesting um, oddities of history, if the particular provost, provost Salmon, <coughs> ill repute, um, hadn't been appointed instead of a man who became ill, who should have been provost, actually women would have got in 30 years, years earlier. Provost Salmon said women were going to enter Trinity over his dead body. Um, the women who went in that, that year, 1904, included Marion Weir Johnston, who had had the temerity in 1901 to ask the benches of King's Inn in, in Dublin um, if she could read for the bar. She got very short shrift. They were astonished that she should even ask. 
reminded me of my own experience in the second wave of feminism, saying to my father that I wanted to be a solicitor, to which the response was, that's no career for a woman. Um, 1905, Eve Jellett graduated Trinity uh, as the first woman doctor. And interestingly, she then went on to serve for many years in India as a medical missionary with Dublin uh, University Mission. Gwyneth Begg, one of the first, first women um, solicitors in England, graduated first class um, from Oxford in 1911, no degree. Frances Nettlefold, first woman to be awarded a first in both parts of the Cambridge Law Trial, class, 1912, no degree. I don't know whether anybody's seen this book, but it's a wonderful history of women's entry um, into education, in, into Trinity specifically. And it's got a fantastic description in one of the chapters about the steamboat ladies. They were the women who came over between 1904 and 1907, and there were over 700 of them, who came from Oxbridge to take out Dublin University degrees which they were allowed to do if they studied at Oxford or Cambridge, because Oxford and Cambridge had a special arrangement with Trinity. Trinity thought they'd, they'd kind of say, well, yes, of course you can come and get them, because only one or two would come over. 700 came over. Not all at once, you understand. But, um, in 1914, a woman called Kathleen Kyle of Belfast was a Lord, law graduate from Trinity, and we'll come back to that name in a moment. And what I admire about, particularly about the two women who I've been looking at over here, is the fact that it, it increasingly became obvious to me that they were work, studying and working in circumstances that were very, very different from the women in England. In 1916, students at, Trin at Trinity sat exams during the Easter Rising. The provost eventually capitulated and said, um, it's too dangerous for you to walk through the streets, but the first few exams were actually sat during the, the Easter Rising. Um, and that's... Attention, please. The search room and reading room will close in 15 minutes. Please finish off your research for this evening. Thank you. <laughs> and that's detailed in the book. Um, in 1919, Oxford finally conceded and women could get degrees. In 1921, the 1st of November 1921, these two women are called to the bar in Dublin. The woman on the left, is Francis Christian Kyle. The woman on the right is Avril Deverell. Avril Stata Carr Deverell, very interesting woman. And the man in the funny little portrait is her twin brother. In subsequent reproductions of this photo, he's been removed in a nice reversal of um, what usually happens. It's usually the women get taken out. So they, Frances was academically brilliant. She was first in just about everything, and she was first to, to be called at the bar because she had come first in the bar exams. She had a John Brooks gold medal. Unfortunately, I suspect because of ill health, she never actually really practiced. But Avril went on to have a very successful uh, career at the bar in Dublin um, as a chancery barrister, which is almost unheard of in those days. And she carried on practicing until well into her 60s. She died in 1979. Frances, however, died in a um, relatively young age, 64, in, in London. And she and her sister spent a lot of time travelling in, in Europe. 
But they, her mother was very well connected. She, he must have known W.B. Yeats because she was part of the Irish Literary Society. And there's um, some correspondence here suggesting that um, there's quite a close connection between all of the, uh, the, the literary figures in, in the day and her family. Someone should write a biography of Frances Kyle. I haven't got time to write it, but they should. And she's, she's an extremely interesting, her and her family are extremely interesting, um, not least because they have connections with all sorts of people, like Edith Shackleton Heald, who was W.B. Yeats's last lover. Does that tempt anybody? Right. Um, 1922, Ivy Williams becomes the first woman to be called to the English Bar, Carrie Morrison, the first woman solicitor, and Helena Normanton, the first woman barrister to practice in England. But the point is that these two women were before them. So the whole purpose of my being here is to try is to go back home and say to people, actually it's the Irish who were first, not us. Because they got in before the treaty was signed. And as a precaution, Francis went back to, came back to Belfast to be called to the Northern Ireland bar because she was concerned that if she'd been called at the Dublin bar, she might not be able to practice in her hometown. And she's called at the Crumlin Road Courthouse, which I see very sadly as in a dreadful state but must have been a very beautiful building at the time. And she came up with John McDermott, who, was, um, who became a, a Chief Justice in, in, um, later on. And they weren't going to be admitted by the Lord Chancellor because the treaty was about to be signed, so he stayed at home. And Sir Dennis Henry, who apparently was a very popular, very nice, very kind man, was conducting the admission ceremony. And as the two of them, McDermott and Carl, approached and stood in front of him, there was a very, very long pause. And then he, then he conducted this very formal ceremony. And some days later, he saw John McDermott and apologised profusely to him. He said, I, I don't know what came over me, but when you and Francis came up the aisle towards me, the only words that would come into my head were, do you take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? <coughs> he said, somehow I thought that would be inappropriate. Okay, just very swiftly then, um, because I, I know some of you will be wanting to go home. Um, 1920, uh, sorry, 1923, uh, Mathanda Tata becomes the first Indian-born woman barrister called to Lincoln's Inn. Um, and Cornelia Sarabji becomes the first um, Indian woman to practice law in an Indian court um, because she's admitted to the Allahabad High Court. Margaret Kidd becomes the first um, Scottish woman advocate, it's a barrister, um, and in 1924 women are officially permitted to practice law in India and Cornelia sets up her own practice. And in 1947, Cambridge finally decided that degrees could be awarded to women. And that was quite a long time after women were admitted to the professions. The 1919 Sex Disqualification Removal Act had admitted women to the professions, including the legal profession. So it was a little odd of Cambridge to sit there and say, we're not going to give women degrees until 1947. Anyway, so, and in 1947, uh, Frances Moran becomes the first Irish woman um, to be admitted to the inner bar and others to take, to take silk. And finally, in 1945, we get our first woman judge stipendary magistrate in Tarbridge. And the list goes on. I won't take you right the way through the timeline, but it may not have escaped your notice that we only have one woman in the Supreme Court in England. 
We don't have a female Chief Justice. They do in Ireland. You seem to have managed to have trumped us all the way down the line. Um, and one of the things that I want to, to do is to leave you with a picture of this woman. This woman, Frances Carl, must have battled through an awful lot to get where she got eventually. The fact that she never practiced or, or only did one or two cases and then gave up is an interesting conundrum which I haven't yet explained. And I think some of it would almost certainly fit with some of the repeated themes that I've come across as I've been researching for this book. It's about, it doesn't matter how bright you are, if you're joining the boys club, you've got to be more than bright. You've got to be very, very canny. An awful lot of these women wanted to wear the wig because it made them look like men. And they behaved an awful lot like men. Here's this very small, very slight woman whose signature is, is quite tiny, his writing is quite tiny, and you get the sense of, of, of a person who's not very forceful. Avril Deverell, who has a very successful career, she's staring, if you look, she's looking straight ahead, she's very confident, and her handwriting is very, very confident indeed. So, I'm sorry you didn't hear the person you were expecting, but I hope that stimulated some, some, some thought. And hopefully, come the centenary in 2019, the next International Women's Day in Ireland, we'll be celebrating women and their professions. Okay, thank you.